what I want to talk about today is consequence. Because how many of you know and realize and understand that there is consequences for everything that we do? And our life itself is a reflection of decisions and choices we've made and the consequences thereof. That's what our life consists of. We don't always like to hear that. We may not always want to believe that. But I know from my own personal experience, 99.9% .9 of all of my troubles came from me and choices and decisions that I made. The thing I think we do not understand and we don't appreciate is that, just as Michelle was saying, we have choices. We have decisions every single day of our life to make. In fact, we are to choose this day whom we will serve. <laughs> Whether we will serve the God of our flesh or whether we will serve Yahweh, whether we will surrender. You know, Yeshua said that if you will pray and believe of touching anything on earth and believe in your heart, it shall be done for you, right? What we don't understand is in order to touch anything on earth that we have to come into agreement with somebody's word. I just want that to soak in for a mo moment. We have to come into agreement with either the word of Yahweh or we can come into agreement with the word of HaSatan who seeks whom he may devour. But he can't devour you unless you agree with him. If he tells you your situation is hopeless and you say, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? You just came into agreement with him which gives him power in your life. But if you do as Yeshua did, as Howard brought out, um, it was like you guys studied my notes or something, you know. It's as if there is a Ruach, a Spirit of God that is speaking to all of us, right? I told you I keep gonna, I'm going to keep slipping into to, uh, schnitzel. <laughs> Can't spend too much time with that guy. Um, but anyway, if we understand and know that if we come into agreement with the word of God and it's the wor his word that we're quoting in every situation and in every circumstance, then what does that do? That gives Yahweh the power of attorney or the legal right to act on our behalf because he will not act on our behalf unless we give him permission to. Even though he's the king of the universe, he doesn't force us into anything. Does that make sense? So we're, we're faced with a decision every single moment of our lives. Will we come into agreement with what our flesh is telling us, with what Hasatan might be telling us? Or will we come into agreement with what does God say? What is Yahweh saying to us today? Because whatever it is, whoever we come into agreement with, we will receive the consequence of that agreement, whether it's blessings or curses. Make sense? So we need to stop ourselves. You know, I, I, w I had some little juvenile delinquents in counseling on Thursday, and a couple of them were there because they had done stupid things with their friends, you know, stole things, you know, they were going through a store and decided, hey, that, I want that, I'm going to take it, you know. And I talked to them in a different way, but I said, you know, you have to stop. When you get an idea to do something wrong, you have to stop. You have to take a deep breath. You have to stop and realize that everything begins between your ears. Good decisions or bad decisions. And the minute you hear a voice that is not the voice of God, that is not the voice of Yahweh, you need to stop and say, no, for it is written. 
For it is written that I am blessed of Yahweh, that I am highly favored, that he is my Elohim, that he is my salvation. And not keep coming into agreement with the adversary. It's so important for us to know and understand this. If you'll turn with me to Matthew, the fourth chapter. I'm going to read part of what uh, Howard was sharing. Then the Spirit led Yeshua up into the wilderness to be tempted by the adversary. After Yeshua had fasted 40 days and nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, order these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of Adonai. Now, I want you to to think about this for a minute because he was actually quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. Except in Deuteronomy, it doesn't say every word that comes out of Adonai's mouth. It might in your translation, but in Hebrew, it does not say that. It says everything that proceeds from his mouth, not his word, but everything that proceeds from his mouth. So I sat and meditated about that this week, and I thought, hmm, this probably means something. Translators put the word, the, the term word in there, but he said everything that proceeds out of his mouth. And then I thought about when he went to um, Mount Her- uh, Herob, and They, um, wait a minute, I totally lost my train of thought here. Ding, 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 Everything that proceeds out of his mouth. Okay. So anyway, when he was at Mount Horeb, what happened was he was speaking the word of God. Okay. He was speaking what he wanted to say. But it wasn't just words that were coming out of his mouth. Because the entire mountain trembled, the entire mountain shook, and caught on fire. And we look at that and think, wow, that's, you know, powerful words. Although his word was powerful, what else comes out of Yahweh's mouth? Breath. Who said breath? Breath, Susan. Breath. The other name for the... Ruach. Words are truth, but when his Ruach is mixed with the words, it becomes spirit and truth. Make sense? It's a powerful concept because that's why Yeshua came to bring the spirit back into the truth. See, when they just, when they went up the mountain the second time, And, and Moses wrote it, or you sh- um, Yahweh wrote it all down. It became words on stone, or, or we have words on paper, but there's no spirit here. And it's easy to become legalistic without the Ruach. So what we are to, to know and understand, that we are to live by everything, spirit and truth, all everything that comes out of his mouth. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 8, 3 through 5. It's up on the screen now. Yay. Thank you, guys. You're you're awesome. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word, or in the Hebrew, it actually means what goes forth from and proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. 
which would be spirit and word, spirit and truth. Joaquin! Yay! Woo! Oh, my goodness. Wow. Now, there's a man of God. And Janine, I didn't even see you back there. Woo! We were all sharing your testimonies this morning and praying for you guys. Signs, wonders, and miracles following. Amen. Amen. But notice what it says um, going back to, the, to this scripture. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger. You know, Yahweh will humble you and allow you to hunger. Why? So that you will know. He didn't, the manna didn't come first. The hunger came first. Do you, do you see that? The manna didn't come first. The hunger came first. In a spiritual sense, are we hungry for the word of God? Are we hungry for his spirit? Do we desire? And notice how it totally parallels with what happened to Yeshua. He was tested because he hungered. Moshe went without food and water for 40 days. Yeshua went without food and water. Do you see that? But he hungered and was tested. What makes us think that we're not going to go through tests? We are. We are. Hamas, I put up there, which means violence. Did you know that the scriptures are absolutely filled with uh, prophecies saying that Jerusalem and Israel would suffer Hamas. Whoa. Do you think it was an accident that they chose that name? Now, in Arabic, it actually means something a little different. It means zeal. But in Hebrew, it means violence. I, th I believe with all my heart, Yahweh put that name in their heads because it fulfills prophecy. It fulfills prophecy. Hamas will fill the land. Hamas will siege Israel. Hamas will try to siege Jerusalem. Violence. I just think it's so amazing. We serve the most amazing King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Notice what I put up here the next is the scriptures clearly state that in the last days, disasters will come. Can we say amen to that? We will see Hamas, violent ones, agents of fear and terror, mobilized against God pe God's people in the land of Israel. But I'm going to submit to you that we're going to see Hamas here. They've already promised it. We already have seen some of it. Controversy over dividing of the city of Jerusalem is arising everywhere, all across the world. At no other time in history have we seen so many nations that have poised themselves to divide the land in an effort to bring peace, a two-state solution to the land of Israel. Like, yeah, that's going to happen. Right? When they left Gaza nine years ago, they left uh, greenhouses and, and farms and beautiful things, and all of the Jews left Gaza, all of them. There's no Jews that live in Gaza. And look what they've done to it. They, they tore down all of the greenhouses. They, you know, what did they do? They built walls and tunnels to destroy Israel to bring Hamas. They even elected Hamas. Oi. Just think about that for a moment. I love what Leviticus says. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. He, the land is not for sale. 
So when they're trying to divide the land and divide the city and make it a two-Palestinian state and an, uh, an Israeli state, it's not, it ain't happening. It's not going to happen. Because God owns the land. It's his. He gets to say who lives there and who doesn't. He makes it very clear that it's not for sale. Beginning in Genesis, God promised the land in his covenant as a blessing for his people. Abraham, by his concubine Hagar, had a son named Ishmael, if you'll recall the story. God promised Abraham that he would bless Ishmael and that he would multiply as a nation. This blessing of Ishmael was not the covenant blessing that God promised to Abraham. Rather, through Isaac, the son of of Abraham and Sarah, God said he would continue his covenant and only through Isaac would the seed of Abraham be recognized. Then God said, and this is in Genesis 17th chapter, if you're taking notes, then God said, no, Sarah, your wife will bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. Now I'm hearing schnitzel in my head again. What is forever? <laughs> if you quit doing it, you're probably not done. Forever and everlasting is forever and ever and ever. And with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Boy, is that ever true. Did God keep his word there, even to Ishmael? He shall beget 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, who Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. When Hagar and Ishmael were cast away by Sarah, God once again prophesied over Ishmael and said that he would be a man of Hamas or violence. Interesting stuff, isn't it? This is the same war we're fighting now. Now, there's nothing new under the sun. It's the same war. Interestingly enough, as I was doing the word study on this this week, which I was like so excited. Hamas is the root word of Hametz, which is leaven. Isaac is the true promise. Ishmael is the leavened. I just, when I read that, I was like, Whoa. you know, when, it, when you do these word studies, all of a sudden God, you know, he'll just like open your eyes to things. I never saw that before. And it was just interesting to me that in every sense of the word, God is true and faithful. Now, here's what I want to bring out before we go on to. The religion of Islam manifested in the bloodline of Ishmael. Islam as a vehicle of deception in the end times is alluded to in the book of Revelation as being under the power of the dragon. In the last days, there will be confusion, are we seeing that, and persecution over whether or not you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is Israel, or in the false God of Ishmael. The division will center on the divinity of Yeshua and the oneness of God, the Echad of God. That's why Yeshua said it was the number one commandment. Shema Yisrael Adonai. Shema Yisrael, the Lord our God, the Lord, he is one. He's a chad with us. So we need to know and understand that first off. Notice what it says in 1 John. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. The spirit of Antichrist was in the earth even then. 
by which we know that it is the last hour. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And no lie is the truth. Who is a liar? But he who denies that Yeshua is the Messiah. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Now, there is a huge move underfoot in churches all over America and all over the world right now uh, to accept uh, Islam. It's called Chrislam. And they're telling people in huge congregations, very respected men of God, you know, peop that people have respected, um, and they're, and they're saying, whether it's Allah or Yahweh, it's the same God. It is not the same God. It is not. We have to know what we believe and why we believe it. We have to know the Torah. Christians are waiting for Jesus to appear in the last days. But did you also know that Islam is waiting for Jesus to appear? The deceptive seeds have been planted that Allah and Yahweh are the same God, simply called by different names. This whole attitude that we've seen of tolerance, we must be tolerant. You know, we must be tolerant of everyone else's beliefs. And political correctness is trying to unify opposing beliefs on the biblical foundation of the oneness of God. While subtly removing Jesus from his divinity, what will happen when the Muslim Jesus arrives performing signs and wonders and even endorsing the worship of Allah? What do you think is going to happen? There's going to be a huge falling away that was prophesied. There's going to, you know, it always cracks me up of how, how shallow we are. Remember a few years ago when Christians were running around to this place and that place because there was gold falling from the ceiling, supposedly, at, at conferences. Do, do anybody remember that? Remember when people were barking like dogs and, you know, and people were going to go witness this great marvelous thing? It's like, seriously? We are so easily deceived. And when you don't have the relationship that intimate knowledge, the understanding of Torah is your foundation, it will be so easy to deceive so many. In fact, Yeshua even said the very elect could be deceived. When you've got some guy coming out saying, hey, I'm Jesus, and you know, they, the Jews had it all wrong all these years. Ishmael is the seed. And look, I'm doing signs and wonders and miracles, and I'm bringing peace. I'm bringing people together of all nationalities, of all cultures. Do you think people aren't going to be deceived? Because they're looking for signs and wonders. I mean, for heaven's sakes, how many times have you heard for thousands of people lining up because there was a picture of Mary on a bagel that was toasted? I mean, seriously. I saw a, a, a thing a while back where somebody had a piece of toast that had uh, an outline that looked, I guess, could have looked like Jesus, could have looked like Yeshua, if, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but the toast went on eBay, and I forget for how many thousands of dollars somebody paid for it. It's like, seriously? But if you think... That when some, when some guy shows up saying he's Jesus and he's performing signs and wonders and doing all these things and bringing peace in the earth, which is prophesied, and you don't know? I mean, if people can be fooled and deceived by a piece of toast, just, just think about that for a minute. We need to know and understand this. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 7, 12. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep 
with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to our fathers. The word of God. We have to know it. We have to speak it. We have to understand it because only by keeping his word, by keeping his commandments, will we have the covenant of our Father. There is deception, great deception in the earth right now. We need not just the word, but the Ruach to give us discernment. We need the spirit, we need spirit and truth. We need to understand the times we're living in and see them for what they truly are. There is so much deception out there. I mean, I've read it, I've seen it, I see it all the time, I hear it all the time. I was talking to Chris on the way to the airport and he saw something on the internet about um, somebody trying to justify mistletoe, right, for Christmas. And it was saying, well, you know, the red berries symbolize the blood of Jesus and the green growth. I mean, just nonsense stuff. It was all part of pagan rituals, you know, when you look up what, what it was all about. But then trying to twist it and slant it. And do you know how many people that probably sounded really good to? Whoa. That is so cool. Let's go out and buy some more mistletoe and hang it up. If we don't have the foundation, our house will collapse. This is why we study Torah. Notice what it says in verse 13. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples and there shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them on those who hate you. Something to remember. The dietary laws. We were just listening to a program yesterday. I don't remember what program it was, Frank, where the person because you made fun of me because I had a Diet Coke there and I was in agreement with this person. I have sinned greatly. But this person was saying, all diseases, all it, it depends on what we are putting in our body. We're either poisoning our body or we're nourishing our body. And, I'm, I, and I was sitting there going, yeah, that's right. He looks over at me. What are you drinking? It's like, <laughs> dang, hate it when I get caught. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm trying. I'm in recovery right now. Gone through the 12 steps. 12 steps weren't enough for me. I needed like 15. So, but what we have to realize is that's the promise of God. If we will follow the dietary laws, if we will take care of ourselves according to what he tells us to do in Torah, then we can lay hold and come. Remember what I was saying just a few minutes ago, what you come into agreement with? Instead of coming, I, th I, I truly believe because I've heard so many people say this. Well, my diabetes is out of control or, you know, my cancer has shown up again. Well, you have just taken ownership of that and said, it's mine. You've come into agreement, not with what the word of God says, but with what some Yehu doctor has told you. You can't come into agreement with a doctor's report. You have to know that Yahweh said that he will take away from you all sickness. 
I want to make that confession to him every day. Father, you said you would take all sickness from me. I am not receiving this illness. I will not be afflicted because I am no longer part of Egypt. I have been set free. For the, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And if you say I'm healed, I am healed. And we have to know and understand that. Also, you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eyes shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. Okay, now as I was looking at that, I thought, you know, we've got a lot of snares. We have made, we look at people, and we say in our heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You know what that says? You know what that speaks to me? It's saying, There's, everybody's doing it. How can I go against what everybody else is doing? So we take on their gods. We believe what they have established as gods over what the Torah says because they're so vast in number and there's so many of them. You know how many times I've heard Christians say, well, how can all these Christians be wrong and you guys be right? Well, gee, I don't know. I used to be one. So, you know, but God, if you will seek God. When somebody asks me that, I, I always say, if you will seek God for truth for yourself, don't believe me. Don't believe anything I'm telling you. Search, ask, and you will find. You know, God has never been in the business of the multitudes. It's always the remnant that he's moved through. We're the ones. Israel was the ones back then that saw nations greater and bigger and more populous. And gosh, let's go do what they're doing without searching for ourselves and following what Yahweh has spoken to our hearts to do. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and wonders and the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. Let me go back to that. That's what we have to remember. How many in here, I just want a show of hands, have experienced miracles in their life? Just look around. Almost everybody in here is hands up. And if it's not, it's probably because you received a miracle that you didn't even know that you received. Those are the things we have to focus on. Those are the things that we have to recognize. Yahweh is, is he's not double-minded. He's not bipolar. He's not angry one minute and happy the next. He is very focused. He knows what's right and he knows what's wrong and he'll discipline us and correct us when we need it, not because we want it, just as he did Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. He didn't give them what they needed always, or what they, I'm sorry, what they wanted always. He gave them what they needed, what they needed to see about themselves. They needed to be hungry so that they would know where their trust was. There's times that we need that. I've learned far more from my trials than I have when I'm on top of the mountain. You don't learn much. It's when you're in the valley that you're seeking and crying out. Every commandment which I command you today, must, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which you, the Lord swore to your fathers. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. That's Deuteronomy 8, 5, and 6. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. That's what we need to know and understand. And going back to um, the land 
that's a possession that he promised our fathers. I wanted to read something that uh, Frank pointed out to me this week, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is so good. I told him I would plagiarize it, so I'm doing it. It's in, um, if you'll turn to Joshua, the 13th chapter, and verse 1. Now, Joshua was old. The years had taken their toll. And Adonai said to him, you are old, and the years have taken your toll. Is their toll. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I don't know. In case you didn't know it, Joshua, you're old. Um, but there is a great deal of land to be possessed. In other words, there's a great deal of land that you haven't conquered yet. And one of those lands, and all of this land here is the land of Palestine and the Philistines. And even Gaza is listed here. I'm not going to read all of them, but Ashdod, Gaza, and all of those are lands right now that they're still fighting for. And so what that reminded me of is our Joshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, who Joshua was a picture of, he's telling us that, lay, I, I believe what this is really saying is later, he says he's old. He didn't really need to tell him he was old. You think Joshua didn't know he was old? This was written for our understanding. That in the latter days, when Yesh before Yeshua comes, there are still lands to be conquered. And it's the same lands that they're fighting over now. Is that amazing? It's so awesome. God's word is so awesome. I mean, when you think about it, you know, this is, this is where we're at in history. There's no greater time or day to be alive than where we're at right now. Notice what Deuteronomy 9.3 says, Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. Woohoo! Before we get to the promised land, our God has gone before us as a consuming fire. That is really good news. That is amazing news. That is awesome to know and understand. You are not in this battle alone. Do you understand that? Do we get that? Yeah, we've got trials. Yeah, things happen. Yeah, bad things are happening to good people all around us. But do we know today whom we serve? Notice what it says in 4 and 5. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Oh. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. Something for us to learn there. We're not all that in a bag of chips because we know Torah. It doesn't make us more righteous than anybody. What we need to do, though, is to learn how to be humble before the Lord and know that it is an honor and a privilege that we understand him. Notice what it says in verse 6. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God has not given you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are stiff-necked people. He could be saying the same thing to us today. It's not because of our righteousness that we possess anything. It's because of Yeshua's righteousness that we have anything. Because we are a stiff-necked people. And you know what a stiff-necked people is? You know, it's like, it's proud. It's not like, you know, you can't turn your head. A stiff-necked people is a people that are proud and arrogant and stubborn. That could describe most of us. Just saying. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 10, 1 and 2. At that time, the Lord said to me, you for yourselves, too, 
two tablets of stones like the first, and come up to me on the mountain, and make yourself an ark of wood, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke and, and put them in the ark. That scripture is so significant because the first tablets were broken and scattered. I want you to get this. This is really good. The first tablets were shattered and broken. The first covenant that us as a people, Israel, had with God, we broke and were fragmented and we were exiled into all the earth. The second tablets were put in the ark, our heart. Do you get that? <sighs> oh, he's so good. Is he good? He is so good. Everything is pointing to this day and this time when he is writing his Torah on our hearts, but not because of our righteousness. I want to go to Isaiah now in the 49th chapter, verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Notice what God says. Can a woman forget his nurse, her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget. He's saying that a, a mother might forget. But he said, I will not forget. See, I have you inscribed on the palms of my hand. Yeshua paid a price. All he has to do is look on the palms of his hand and see us. Because he died for us. He says, your walls are continually before me. I looked that up, and it's koma, koma which is, actually means uh, meaning to join or a wall of protection. So his protection, he never looks away from. It's before him. Notice what it said. Your walls are continually before me. Those things that I've built to protect you. Vicki brought up something uh, to me this morning that I thought was quite profound, and it goes right along with this, and she had no idea that I was going this tact, but she brought up in prayer as we were praying that Daniel actually had to go into the lion's den. He wasn't spared from going in, but yet God ultimately spared him. And what she said that I thought was so profound that I'm plagiarizing right now, I'll tell you she said it this time, next time I won't. <laughs> just fair warning not because I'm selfish it's because I forget <laughs> but yeah <laughs> but I'm planning to yeah I came into agreement with that plan but um, what we view as protection may not be what Yahweh views as protection because D Daniel did go into the lion's den but he never wavered he never doubted. He knew Yahweh would deliver him. Is that powerful? That's the heart I pray that we have. That we don't waver. We don't grow faint. Even when we might say, well, Yahweh was supposed to protect me. They're leading me right into the lion's den. No, we should go in knowing Yahweh is my king. I serve him. Yeshua HaMashiach, my Savior, my Redeemer, will come through for me. And just keep walking straight to the lion's den if that's where you're being led or, or thrown to. But know that Yahweh is Lord. Yahweh 
is one. He is our hope. He is our confidence. He is everything. And I just wanted to, um, I didn't put it on the PowerPoint, but I wanted to read something else from Isaiah. Uh, in, in Isaiah, let's see, where is it at? Uh, 22, uh, 49, 22. Oh, no, let me go up to 17. Your children are coming quickly. Your destroyers and plunderers, uh, Isaiah 49, Verse 17, your destroyers and plunderers are leaving and going. He's speaking to Israel right now. Raise your eyes and look around. They are all gathering and coming to you. But we named a, the radio program that we're going to have on gathering the nations based upon the scriptures here. Adonai swears, as surely as I'm alive, you will wear them like jewels. <sighs> Jerusalem will wear us like jewels. We're the nations that are gathering right now. We have been dispersed all over the earth. And yet he says that, that we will uh, be adorned like a bride. For your desolate places and ruins and your devastated land will be too cramped for those living in it. That's how many of us there will be. Your devourers will be far away. The day will come when the children born, when you were mourning, will say to you, this place is too cramped for me. Give me room so I can live. Then you will ask yourself, who fathered these for me? I've been mourning my children alone as an exile, wandering to and fro, so who has raised these? I was left alone. So where have these come from? And Adonai Elohim answers, I am beckoning to the nations, raising my banner for the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their shoulders. Kings will be your foster fathers, their princes, your nurses. They will bow down to you, face toward, uh, they will bow to you, face toward the earth, and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am Adonai. Those who wait for me will not be sorry. But can booty be wrestled from a warrior? Can a victor's captives be freed? Here is Adonai's answer. Even a warrior's captives will be snatched away and the booty of the fearful will be freed. I will fight those who fight you, and I will save your children. I will feed those opposing you with their own flesh. They will be drunk on their own blood as with wine. Then everyone will know that I, Adonai, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Woo-hoo! Yeah, come on, let's... Oh... So good, so good. Are you guys glad to be alive today? To see what you're seeing, to know what you're knowing, to understand the awesomeness of our God? We're not reading about history anymore. We're watching it unfold. We're living it. It's the most exciting time of all to be alive. We do not need to be afraid. We do not need to be fearful for the mighty one of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is our king. Amen.